Hey guys, so I am making this video pretty spontaneously. Uh, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week and I've seen a lot of pretty amazing and inspiring stories from other people talking about their own experiences with their mental health and I figured I have never spoken about mine before and I would like to share it in the hope that maybe it will be able to help someone else or give some information to someone else uh, out there. This video will be about my obsessive compulsive disorder, otherwise known as OCD, um, and the anxiety that uh, comes with it. So no one's exactly sure what starts OCD. Some believe it's genetic, and some believe it is a product of your environment. Um, I believe that's what mine is. Uh, I grew up, without going into too much detail, I grew up in an environment which was quite fraught and unhappy um, and quite difficult and I believe that I developed OCD tendencies as a way of a coping mechanism to have some control over something because I didn't know how to deal with what was going on around me. So I remember I would uh, I would become very fixated on the idea of, of hitting my head in my on my temples and I would I remember sitting in primary school and just like trying to do it and I would become obsessed with the idea of that. Um, I became obsessed with doing these these rituals before I went to sleep that meant that bad things wouldn't get me. Uh, it was all about visualising certain things, counting certain numbers, like doing these behaviours uh, which was very much the early start of my OCD. Like with many mental health uh, illnesses, it got worse as I got older. Um, you, I did a video actually on my experience with bullying but when I was a teenager uh, I would say that my situation for me got worse. Uh, school was very unhappy, still had, uh, I would say, an unhappy environment that I was living in. So those two combined just meant my OCD was out of control. The anxiety uh, was uncontrollable for me. So for everyone that experiences OCD, uh, it, it obviously manifests itself in a very different way. Um, I would like to make that point that the, the word OCD is thrown around so easily people say like oh i've got to have my desk tidy i'm so ocd or you know oh if i don't i don't know clean my clothes um after i get them dirty i can't just leave them in the washing bin i'm so ocd um yes those actually might be ocd things but if it's not <laughs> if it's not you're doing these things as a way of controlling your unbearable anxiety and it's consuming your life and you can't live a normal life because it rules you it's really not OCD it might just be that you're very tidy or um, you have a certain way of doing things uh, so I'd like to point that out that that is very frustrating because it's like until you have OCD you know that those things are not OCD so when I was a teenager some of my uh, rituals got very out of control so I'll give you an example of uh, some of the things I would used to do so I had a thing about windows about containers, about uh, touching objects in certain ways. So for example, every time I left the bathroom, I would have to uh, do a sort of ritual with the windows and I'd have to imagine them red and then I would have to go and tap them in variables of threes and fives. And I'd have to go around doing that until I felt okay. And that okay, I guess, was uh, a, a, a short burst of relief from that anxiety. Unfortunately, you never know when that okay is going to happen, so I could stand there for 10, 20 minutes just tapping windows, tapping windows, closing my eyes, thinking red to blue, red to blue, red to blue. If you think about it, you do that every time you go to the loo, that's a lot of your day spent doing something like tapping windows. Uh, that's just one of the things. Uh, if I left, if I went into the kitchen, I hated going into the kitchen, I would avoid going into the kitchen because if I was in the kitchen, I would have to do a ritual involving the hob. Um, and that involved... Uh, looking at it with my eyes in a certain way, then my hands behind my back looking at it with my eyes, um, and then uh, counting to a certain number pattern and then looking at it. If someone came in the room and tried to touch the hob, I would feel physically like I was going to be sick. I would have to scream at them, do not touch that hob. Like, don't, do, just get away from it. Like, it makes me feel anxious thinking about it now. Like, the, uh, the anxiety, like, oh, anyway. Um, tapping doors, uh, door handles, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, I can be that, laugh, damn, that, that pattern ruled my life. Uh, I would do that every time I touched a door handle. Uh, if I walked down the street, I couldn't look 
behind me because I would have to look one, two, one, two. So I would be doing this like, look behind me, look behind me, look behind me. I couldn't look at people's windows uh, because if I did, I would get these really cr like intrusive, crazy thoughts. I would have uh, very horrifically intrusive thoughts about things that uh, I couldn't seem to control. So I would obsess over them and all the terrible things that I was a terrible person because I was thinking those things. I find it very difficult to have conversations with people because the entire time I would think that I was saying something wrong. So people would be replying to me, I would be saying something normal, but they would reply and I would just be thinking, oh God, what I've said is wrong. And then obviously I've got to try and catch up with the conversation and the entire time I'd be getting more anxious because it's like, I just can't do this. I can't, I can't talk to people. If I closed a lid, like you close a milk carton or something, I'd have to do it until it felt right never knew what that right was, but I'd have to keep doing it until it felt right. We had a sort of cage on the outside of the door. I would have to shake that in variables of threes and fives, hitting it in a certain different way with my hand, first like that, then like that, then like that, uh, until, again, it felt right. She says a pattern with OCD. It's a lot of the time it's doing something until it feels right, uh, which can, well, it's never really right, because the second that you do it right and you get the relief, uh, that anxiety just comes back again and will come back again every time you do those things. So you have no no release from it. There is no escape from these horrible thoughts that control your mind. So looking back, I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. I could not function as a human being. I was, uh, in turn, because of that, became very depressed because I was just so miserable in my own thoughts, um, which was controlling my life. And I didn't really realize that I was ill. Uh, I just knew that I was very unhappy. I would also assume that I would be doing something wrong if I said something wrong, that someone would hear it and they would know and I would obsess with that about that thought, thought for weeks. I wouldn't sleep because I'd be worrying about it. Uh, I remember also sometimes I would get contamination fears. I touched a bin at the hospital once and I felt like I, I, I don't get personally hand washing um, rituals, but I became obsessed with the idea that I was now going, like this disease was all over me and I, oh, and yeah. So as you can probably gather, uh, it was very uh, difficult uh, to get by day to day because everything triggered some form of OCD. You know, going into the bathroom, going into the kitchen, touching a hand or touching anything, doing this, talking to a person. Yeah, it's like, ah, oh, it was exhausting. It was exhausting and it was very difficult. It was about the age of 20. So this has been going on for years now. And I hid it. I hid it very well. I don't think any of my friends really knew that I wasn't well. Um, because I was so mortified that anyone would know that I was doing these weird things, that I would hide it. Um, and in turn, I had to leave many jobs couldn't hold a job down because um i would be doing these these rituals at work and i just it was it, i couldn't i was so embarrassed to do it in front of people but that i couldn't not do it because otherwise i would have a panic attack so it, it, i had to leave a lot of jobs because i just i couldn't i was very unwell um i had i dropped out of university twice uh, because of my ocd um it, it was badly impacting my life but at the same time, I don't think anyone really knew how much I was struggling because, again, this is why Mental Health Awareness Week is good. I didn't think I could talk about it. I genuinely thought that people would think I was a weirdo and that there was something wrong with me. So I shouldn't talk about it. I should just get on with it. Which obviously is not the way that you should be thinking. So at the age of around the early early 20s, I'd say, I think I started confiding in my mum that uh, something wasn't right. Obviously, she, you know, she knew that I wasn't, I wasn't holding down a job or I had dropped out of university and things obviously weren't quite right there. Um, so I began what I would say has been a, was about a six year recovery. It didn't work, it was a very, it didn't really work at first. So I started with therapy. Um, I did it through the NHS. Uh, I'm very lucky living in, in the UK that I can do that for free. Unfortunately, the NHS has a long way to go when it comes to mental health, so you have to wait a very long time. I had to wait a very long time to be seen by someone, and then sometimes you'll get six sessions, and it's like, well, six sessions is not going to cure 22 years of uh, <laughs> horrific mental health illness, um, but, you know, you've got to take what you can get. When I first started, it didn't work for me at all. felt so uncomfortable talking to a total stranger about what was wrong with me, and I wouldn't tell them everything, which obviously means... 
uh, therapy doesn't work if you don't tell the person everything. I was too embarrassed. I was like, oh, I'm a weirdo who has to do all this weird stuff. I thought they'd be thinking, oh, nutter. So I would just be like, oh, I'm really anxious. And it's like, well, they can't help you if they don't actually know what's wrong with you. And I, and I would like to say this to anyone that has is thinking about getting therapy or has had therapy and it hasn't worked. I saw a total of, must have been seven or eight therapists. And that's in hospitals and therapists. Um, and I would say two of them I really gelled with, two of them. The other ones, they just weren't right for me. There is no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes you just won't click with that person and you'll, you'll, you'll talk to them, but you just don't get anything from it. You feel uncomfortable or you don't really believe that, that what they're saying is true and it just doesn't work. So for me, it was a case of over the course of about five years, this didn't happen overnight, I would see different people. Um, and weirdly enough, I always thought I would never be able to open up to a man. And I always wanted to see a woman therapist. And then uh, my last therapist I saw was a guy and I was like, oh, I don't want to talk to a guy. I don't want to open up to a guy. Like, I can't do that. And he was actually amazing. Uh, he understood me so much. He, uh, the therapy techniques that he used uh, really, really spoke to me. Um, he fought to get my sessions extended. Uh, so I got like 20 sessions. Um, and it, he was incredible. I can't, I can't thank him enough. He was amazing. If you're wondering about therapy and how that would work, um, I think uh, uh, many places will do CBT, which is Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Um, a lot of it is working out um, your actions and then using something called exposure therapy. So exposure therapy is basically making yourself do the things that you don't want to do. It's horrible. So let's say I touched a doorknob. My exposure therapy homework for that week might be not to tap it like that. I have to just walk away. And I have to do that once, all right? If I just have to do that once, and that would be my, my therapy, uh, my homework kind of thing. And then when I spoke to my therapist the next time, we would talk about it. So I did it. How anxious did I feel? You know, we would sort of talk about the, the anxiety levels, how long it took to go away, what the repercussions were of me not touching it. Um, you know, how do, do I feel like I can do it again? And it's, although it's horrible forcing yourself to do things that you have specifically shielded yourself from for years, uh, it does actually, for, for me, it does. It did help. I So many times I didn't do it because I was like, oh, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. But when I sort of made myself do it, it does, it does help because you start to think, wait a minute, like, I didn't touch the thing and nothing happened. And it felt horrible. And it would have been so easy just to tap it and then feel better, but I didn't. And nothing happened and I feel okay. Like I said though, therapy doesn't work for everyone, it really doesn't. Um, it took me a very long time to find someone that helped me. So don't feel down on yourself if you don't want to talk to someone or you do it and it doesn't work for you anyway, because it's not for everyone. Another big part of my pro uh, sort of healing process was uh, medication. So medication is stigmatized, I still think very badly. Uh, I've spoken to lots of people that have uh, suffered with their mental health and they say that they don't want to take medication because they, you know, it, it, it means you're ill or it means it's putting chemicals in your brain or like they're scared of what people will think of them, that they're weak because they need to take pills to be better. So, you know, stupid analogy time. If you had allergies and you needed to take antihistamines and then it made your allergies better. I don't see why there's any difference to having uh, a mental health feeling bad and taking something to make you feel better. I don't think it should be ever, ever judged as anything else. Um, I started, uh, I again fl went to various different medications because uh, they for whatever reason didn't work for me. Some of them gave me really bad side effects. Uh, uh, some of them made me not be able to sleep at night. Some of them made me really sick. Um, and obviously those sound like horrible stories, but it was a case of, I don't like this, go back to the doctor, this isn't working for me. Uh, the one that I am now on is called fluoroxetine, and I started off on a small dose and that wasn't enough, so I'm now on a bigger dose. Uh, but I'm not spaced out, I'm not a zombie, I'm not, not me, I can feel feelings, I'm not numb to stuff. I'm just so much better. Um, I've been on them for about three years. I still take them every night. Uh, I spoke to my doctor the other day. He said, are you still happy on them? I'm like, yep, they're doing good. They're, they're good. Like, I don't why I don't really see why I'd go off them. So when I said earlier on in the video that this was, uh, hopefully had quite like 
a, re a reassuring ending. It's that during the course of my recovery, over those years of doing therapy and taking medication, I slowly started to get better. Um, my anxieties calmed down a lot. My need to do OD OCD tendencies calmed down a lot. It took a very long time, but I started to go back to work and I started doing part-time stuff. Uh, and slowly but surely, I then got sort of proper jobs, working full-time, that, you know, a few years of doing that. And now uh, I have a full-time job that I love, that I've been doing for almost two years now, um, which is why some of you might know me. And I am, I'm happy to say, doing pretty damn good. I will always have OCD. I will always have the urge to do certain things. I still do, every now and again, I still do certain things. When I leave this hotel room, I will tap the handle in a certain way because I do, I do that at hotels. I don't know, I just do. But it's not debilitating. And um, I, I know I can control it, I can. If I get, if, a, if, a, if life gets particularly stressful, the OCD will get worse, as it's my mind's way of coping with stress. The OCD just comes out when I'm stressed. But due to the therapy sessions I had, which helped me understand my OCD, and the medication I take, which helps me control my OCD, I am able to live a normal life. I don't think you can cure your illness or whatever it may be that's troubling you but you manage it and I found a way to manage my OCD and my anxiety I'm still quite an anxious person people that know me know that I'm quite I'm quite anxious but I can the difference between me now and me 15 years ago is that I can function and my life is not ruled by it and I have a job and I can, I'm in America right now, like for my job. Lydia, this, like a few years ago, would not be doing this. Lydia couldn't do anything. So I don't mean this to be a ta-da, look at this, product of success, because that doesn't work for everyone. Not everyone gets on with medication. Not everyone gets on with therapy. Not everyone can, can reach a point where they can make a video like this. And I don't mean to be like, wow, I'm so amazing. I just want people to know that if you're struggling, there is a, there is hope. There's hope. I thought I had no hope. I remember thinking that my life was a waste because what was the point? Like, my, I remember thinking, oh, my older brother's so successful and he's got like a proper job and my friends have got proper jobs and my friends have got degrees and I can't, I can't, I'm just a, like, what am I doing? I can't do anything. I can't even bloody like shut a window. Like, what's, what's, I'm a failure. I'm not a proper like person. And now, um, after lots of uh, trying and difficult times, I am perfectly functioning and I'm okay. And like, it's all good. It's, it's fine, like, I'm, I'm happy. Um, so I hope that maybe this can give you a little bit of hope too. Um, thank you for listening to my very long story. Like I said, I've never spoken about this before on the internet. I don't think really many people at all know this about me. And now loads of people are gonna know this about me. But I want people to know that it's not a bad thing to be unwell and you shouldn't hide it or feel like you're not allowed to talk about it because it's real and it's awful. And let's be open about it. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Um, lots of love to all of you out there and I'll see you again soon.